And um, the first thing to understand, this is not right. You should just be able to click forward. There you go. Okay, it just, it didn't work the first time. All right, I think we're good now. Sorry about that. Okay, so there are two types of student loans. The first thing kind of important to know is that there's federal loans and there are private loans. So federal loans are gonna have a fixed interest rate over the life of the loan. The fees are charged upfront and um, they re it reduces the amount of receipts. So if the fee is $50 and you get a thousand, um, then it's 950 is what you actually would receive. So on the private loan side of things, the interest rates can be, they can be fixed or they could be variable. Um, and the fees, may, there may be fees charged up front and or throughout the loans. So it's just going to be specific to um, whatever financing company you're working through, whether it's a bank or a program of some sort. So go a little further into the federal student loans first. Um, the first key thing to understand is that you must be at least a half-time student in order to apply. Um, and then there are four different types of federal loans. So there are direct subsidized, direct unsubsidized, direct plus, and direct consolidation. So to further on some of those, um, talking subsidized versus unsubsidized first, um, in both cases, the student is the borrower and there are no credit requirements. However, for the uh, subsidized loans, the school determines the amount that the student can receive. And um, what's really important with the subsidized and the main difference is that there's no interest charge while the student is in school, at least at half time basis. Versus the unsubsidized loans, um, everyone's eligible, assuming general eligibility requirements are met. But this, the interest does accumulate um, while the student is in school. They may not have to pay it um, once school, but it will still accrue. So on the bottom here, there's a note that um, the 2019-2020 academic year, the loan rate was 4.53%. Um, and then the other important key thing to understand is that the rate begins six months after graduation or when the student is no longer at least a half-time student. So the third type of federal loan that was noted was the PLUS loan, the parent PLUS loan. Um, in this case, the parent is the borrower and the approval is based on the credit of the parents. So uh, it would depend on um, the cost of the college as well. The one key thing that's important here is that if parents are denied due to adverse credit for any reason, a student may be eligible for higher unsubsidized loan amounts and they need to contact the school on that to find out um, what options they would have when it comes down to that. You can see the rate on this is quite a bit higher. Um, it was 4.3 on the student loans, but the parent loan is 7.08 based on last year's academic year. And these ones, their payment does begin while the student's college, but it can be differed by the parent. Um, here we're talking about the application. Um, so it's really important that you complete the FAFSA. So all of these loans require the FAFSA. So the free application for federal student aid, um, it's really important that you read the financial offers, complete the master promissory note, and you complete the entrance counseling. So, and if you have questions, those are process specific. It's really important um, to get those questions answered and the OCAN or the MCANs can help with that. Um, the next section here, we're talking about how, how do we receive our loans? So the funding is gonna be sent to your school directly. And then quite often the funds are gonna be um, split by semester. So. If you get a student loan for 10,000, 5,000 goes to the first semester and 5,000 goes to the second semester. The school will apply the funds to your school account that's used for tuition, fees, and room and board. And then if there were funds left over at the end of that, 
um, those would be issued back to you. Um, you may be able to use them to purchase textbooks um, or something of that sort, something school related. So in talking about how much you can borrow, it, it does vary, um, but the first thing to know is once you get your award letter, um, it's really important to talk to the financial aid department um, and they can tell you what other funding might be available, um, if there's tuition payment plans. So if you know your student loan only covers a portion of it and able to set up a, a tuition payment plan for the rest, that might be a good option than not ending up with the student loan in the end. Um, the actual amount can depend on the grade that you're in. Um, it can depend on the program of study or the type of degrees. So a uh, graduate degree is an associate's or a bachelor's. It could be different there. And the individual schools, again, are going to determine the amount that you're eligible for. Um, there is a limit on the total amount of debt. Um, and that last line is kind of important. Um, it, the range is anywhere from 5,500 to 20,500 per year, which is a pretty big range, um, especially when you're doing that in half um, per semester as well. Yes, so, it's great. I want to make sure that you understand uh, there are limits on the amount of loans that you can get each year. So on the left-hand side, you have dependent students. So that's determined, again, when you complete your FAFSA, if you're a dependent or an independent student. And most of you will be dependent students. There's very certain circumstances where you are determined as an independent. So for dependent students, the maximum amount that you can receive year one is capped for subsidized loans at 3500 and then you can see subsequently each year following um, those those rates do increase on those unsubsidized loans though however you can only receive two thousand dollars of an unsubsidized loan as an undergraduate student each year um, and then the, down there at the bottom you can see your total loan limit for dependent students throughout your entire undergrad, whether it takes you four years or six years or eight years or whatever to finish, is $31,000. That's the maximum amount that you can receive through federal student loans. Now over on the right-hand column, you can see for independent students or for students whose parents um, were not able to secure a Parent PLUS loan, Kayla mentioned that earlier, there is a circumstance where if a parent's credit does not allow them to receive that Parent PLUS loan, you can appeal that. And when you do appeal it, what happens is um, the student will receive the higher amount. So they'll reissue uh, the offer for the student's loan amount, and it will be those numbers in the right-hand column. So what you would do if that does actually happen, um, that you're declined those Parent PLUS loans because of credit, or if you know you'll be declined the Parent PLUS loans because of credit, I would recommend that you apply and then appeal because then what happens is they bump your student's offering up. However, also be very careful with that because you don't want your student taking out more loans than they can handle. So just to, to be clear on that one. And then the total amount there for independent students for undergrad uh, is $57,500. So next screen. It's not working now. <laughs> Slowly, slowly. Yes. So once you uh, determine and you receive your financial aid awards from the colleges, you're going to lay those all out uh, and take a look at if you have two or five or however many colleges you were looking at. Um, take a look at your financial aid awards and see what's offered. You'll see your loan amounts and your grant amounts are going to be the same but then there might be some different amounts that are offered from the school. So once you determine where it is that you're gonna go, and then you determine that gap of how much more you're going to need, that's when you might wanna start considering a private loan. 
Before you do that, however, I always recommend calling the financial aid department of the school and telling them, this is the gap that I have in order to come there, even if I accept all of the federal loans being offered, all of the scholarships that I have, all of the grants that I may have, um, I still have this gap. Is there any other pots of funding that I might be eligible for? And the reason I recommend that you do this is because when you apply to a college and you complete your FAFSA, that's what starts the whole process of the financial aid award. And so if you think about it, all of the people that apply to, let's just say, Ferris State University, they're going to issue those financial aid awards to all of those students, but not all of those students are going to end up attending Ferris State. They might choose a different college. So sometimes it happens that there's certain pots of money being um, monies from the institution that may open back up. So say they've awarded out all of a certain scholarship that they have, but only 20% of those students actually end up attending. So that's why I recommend always calling the school and just give it a shot, ask the question. It can never hurt. And oftentimes they might be able to help you in another way. I'm not promising it, but that's the next step that I would take. Um, then you would wanna start looking for those private loans after you've exhausted all of their possibilities. And the reason I say that is because private student loans um, tend to have a higher interest rate than federal loans. So there are lots of places that you can find private student loans uh, locally. Um, family financial credit unions, nearly all credit unions have some sort of student loan available. Lake Michigan Credit Union, um, Fifth Third Bank also has student, or student loans available. And then Shelby State Bank, uh, where Kayla is from, and um, I'm sure she can tell you a little bit more about that, but I'll go ahead and read through. And Kayla, if there's anything you wanna add, go ahead and add. But the borrower at Shelby State Bank can be a student or a parent. Um, it's a really simple application that you would just go through or you would go online and have sent to you. Um, it's an instant credit decision. So private loans are based on credit. And there's no prepayment fees. So there's nothing that you're gonna owe up front. Um, and they're able to build a plan that really fits your budget. So they're gonna help you think about what makes sense to take out. So maybe you end up with award letters that have you needing to come up with a large amount at a certain school. And at another school, they're able to offer you some sort of institutional aid from that school. And that makes that amount of private loan way less that might help you make the decision on where you go to college. Um, so there are refinancing options as well through Shelby State Bank. Um, and so you can choose when you do graduate from college on what does your, your refinancing or repayment plan look like? What fits you best? Kayla, is there anything else you wanted to add then about the Shelby State Bank private loans? I just know that it's very simple. It's an online application that um, you get an answer right back. And I do know several people that have applied and, and they said it's very easy. Awesome. So these options have not been available as readily available in the past couple of years. So a lot of our local banks um, have been kind of stepping up to the plate and starting to offer student loans. So that's really helpful. You can also look beyond local. There are um, many places you can look online. I know Discover has some really good student loans that I've heard people have really good luck with. So if that's a route that you want to go, um, then there's, there's a lot of places and we're gonna show you some online resources of where you can search for additional loans. Um, next slide. So now is the point when we would open it up for questions. Um, if you have them, you're welcome to unmute yourself or you're welcome to put the, the questions in the chat and we will make sure that those get answered at that time, at this time, right now. I have a question. Go for it. So you were talking about how the type of degree might, uh, will decide um, financial aid in the sense of like loans and stuff. Is that um, strictly the length of the degree or is it the major also? 
It is the length of the degree. It is not, I don't think it's at all pertinent to what major, what you're majoring in. Um, so sometimes you might be going to college to complete a certificate or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. So it's gonna be the length of those degrees and the program that you're in, not necessarily your major. I don't think that that comes into play. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Trying to look and see if we had any other questions. Okay, how about, ah, did we discuss deferment during attendance? That's a good one, thank you. Um, so deferment means if you want to defer your loan while you are in school, um, you can defer that. There are also other reasons why you might need to defer your loan. And what that means is you're basically putting off the payment. Um, and so there's a way to apply for deferment of your loan. So putting off that payment or forbearance, which is another terminology that allows you to put your loan payments off. And there are a number of different reasons why you might need to do that. Um, one that might be that you're going back to school or when you are in school, you can defer that loan so you don't have to make the payments at that time. Um, also, once you graduate, you may be able to defer or get a forbearance if you're having economic hardship. That might be another reason, but federal student loans, uh, I know that they are very, very willing to work with you and set up payment plans that work. Um, I've deferred my student loans a couple of different times for a couple of different reasons, but it's very important um, that you know and you ask for help before you need it. Don't get behind on your payments, just call and they'll, they'll, they're they'll willing to work with you. Um, so another thing is that Kayla mentioned the rates for the 1920 school year on federal loans. And that was around, I don't remember exactly what the slide said, but it was around 4.8, I think. Um, and But for 2021, those student loan rates have gone down. So the federal government has reduced student loan rates to 2.75 for subsidized and unsubsidized loans. So they've reduced the rates considerably for this next school year. Um, it's understandable that all of you are potentially um, you know, trying to really figure out how you're going to pay for college and you may have some some hurdles that weren't there before. Additionally, I guess the private rates are down as well, just because rates as a whole for the economy are down. Mm -hmm. um, so that it just trickles down to all areas. That's great. I'm glad to hear that as well. Um, Another thing I was going to mention that we've mentioned the last couple of nights, but I want to make sure that you really understand is that when you complete your FAFSA, you are using your parents and your 2019 tax information, right? So that's two years ago. Um, so we understand, everyone understands that a lot of people's financial situations or family situations have changed um, since 2019. And so what you would do if your financial situation has changed is you would still complete the FAFSA with those 2019 numbers and the 2019 taxes. And then as soon as you get your award letters, you contact the financial aid department of the schools, of the colleges that you get the award letters from, and you let them know, I need to fill out the form that says my income or my family size has changed. And so they will have those forms available and ready for you um, all of the financial aid departments are prepared for this, and you just have to submit a new form with some new information, um, letting them know how your situation has changed since 2019, and then they will issue a new financial aid award to you. So the process might be a little bit more lengthy, um, and you may have to submit a few more documents, but they are very understanding that people's financial situations have changed. I have a question. Go for it. So, um, with, uh, you were talking about financial aid, you'll get like a, something from the college about that. So I applied early admission to a few places. Do you know if that, um, happens like later, like around what time period does that usually start happening? 
Yep, so that's a really good question. And um, so the question is, when do you receive award letters, right? So all colleges do that very differently, but oftentimes they wait to start sending award letters until January. Um, some of them for early, early um, admissions do send them earlier, but most of them wait until kind of the application period of this fall is over, and then they start sending award letters. So really, um, I wouldn't start getting antsy and looking for those award letters until, fe until January or February. So, so, once, are, so are yeah. they like separate from admission decision, like yes. letters? Yep, yep. So you're going to get your admission decision letter. So say you applied to, to four universities or colleges or training centers. You're going to get your admissions information. You're often going to get uh, an email set up or a portal or somewhere to go and look on like a login for that college. And, and then later on, you're going to get your financial aid award. It's a separate piece that comes from a separate part of the college. That was a really good question. Hi, this is Jody. I just want to add to what Alyssa was sharing. Right now with COVID, some schools have converted a lot of those um, award letters to online, whereas they used to traditionally send them through the mail pretty much consistently because people are working away from their offices. You may receive it to the email address um, that you applied for and sometimes like filters into your junk mail or your spam. So be sure to be checking that. So this is also just an awkward time for high school seniors because as far as your email accounts, so when you apply to colleges, you should have used something other than your high school email because that's going to end, right? If you didn't, that's okay. You're just going to need to update the colleges with a new email. So most of high school seniors have already created a new email. So something simple like your name, your first name, that last name at Gmail. Um, you want to keep those email addresses that you're using simple and professional. That's very important at this point. Um, so using and checking those emails often, because as Jody said, most colleges have switched to letting you know information. So Jonathan, maybe you received your acceptance via email from the college that you applied to. And if they gave you portal information or some way to log on, they may share your award letter in that portal or in that logon that they gave you. So you're gonna need to make sure to check back in the multiple different places, again, in your spam, in your school, high school email, and in your new email that you've created. So make sure that you're kind of checking all of those at this point, as well as potentially the, the, po the post mail. You may still get award letters and acceptance letters there as well. Further questions? Alyssa, this is Jody again. I just, I want to share one more thing about student loans because one, I'm, I'm paired with a child with student loans mm -hmm. and I took out student loans. So something that I think is really helpful as a rule of thumb, for every $10,000 you borrow, you can think about having a, at least a $100 a month payment for that once the student has ended college, been out of college for six months, or graduated. Yeah, that is a really good point. And I have two students with student loans right now, and I still am paying on my own. So, Jody, do you recall what the recommended amount of borrowing is based on your potential first year of, um, of pay? Uh, my, so I don't know what it is per major, but my personal rule of thumb is you don't want to borrow more than a year's salary. Yeah, that's what it was. So your first year's salary of the potential career, so sometimes you can look that up, of what you might consider making if you know what you're going to be doing. Um, you don't want to borrow more than that first year's salary. That's kind of the financial rule of thumb on that. Um, so keep that in mind as you're planning out your your years as well. The other thing I wanted to um, also mention about deferment, just to be 100% clear, is that students, while you're taking six credits or more, 
for your federal student loans, they're going to be automatically deferred as long as you've completed entrance counseling and you haven't stopped out for more than six months from school. Other student loans, family or uh, the parent loan or private loans have different terms, so you want to pay attention to those. All right, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask a question still, Kayla, if you want to skip to the next slides so we can share um, that. So there are a couple of really good websites out there that are very helpful. Um, the first one being that federal student aid site. I can't tell you how helpful and user-friendly user that is. Everything we just talked to you about loans, there's 10 more items on that website and it's very simple and easy to understand. So I would highly recommend for student loans or scholarships or whatever it is um, that if you have questions you go there first. They also have a, a chat bot. I forget what his name is but you can connect to their chat. Um, he actually has a name and I don't remember what it is on that site um, and that chat bot can also help you through the FAFSA as well. But if you are interested in connecting with a person and you want to connect on Zoom, just like we are right now, or over the phone, um, like I said, we are going to be sending out an email, and you will be able to. We will connect you directly at a time that works for you um, during the day, in the evening, whatever. You'll set up an appointment um, with the financial aid representative, and they will call you or Zoom call you and work right through all of these things with you. So a couple of other sites, the Oceana College Access Network, there's a, a slew of information on there about paying for college. Um, there's also a scholarship search or a scholarship uh, listing on there. We're in the process of updating that right now to make sure all of the links are valid, but it goes through and provides some information about local, uh, state, and national scholarships and some links and some eligibility. That's one place you might want to take a look for scholarships. Um, and then the Michigan College Access Network page, I'm not sure how super helpful that will be, but there is a lot of information on there. Um, the other site I would recommend is Sally May. Um, SallyMay.com also has a, a ton of information about paying for college. So additionally, if you can skip to the next slide, Kayla. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, Kayla has her information on there. If you want to ask more questions about the private loans from Shelby State Bank, uh, she can help you with that. Um, I'm always available anytime any questions you have, you can reach out to me, um, as well as Jody, who is on the call. She's from Mason College Access Network, if you're from Mason County. Um, and then Hannah from Lunch Manistee. Their information is not up here. Um, but Hannah can also help you. She is the College Access Coordinator in Manistee County. So the additionally, your college advisors. So some high schools in our area have college advisors and their primary role is to work directly with students. Um, and so Emma Urbanski is the college advisor, uh, shared time at Hart and Shelby. She can also help with anyone from Walkerville or Pentwater. So there's her information there. And there are college advisors in Manistee and Mason County as well. I just don't have their contact information up here. Um, and then I think that is all. A question just came in here. Do I have a ballpark income range where you'll know that you um, could, your child won't qualify for student aid? So no, the answer to that is there is no way for us to give a ballpark idea because it's all dependent on your household size as well. Um, and so your household size we talked about in, uh, when we are talking about the FAFSA, it's really important to document who lives in your house, whether they're a part of your family or not. Um, so it's all based on household size, which degree program or length of time your degree is, and then which school you're going to. So there isn't really a way to, to do an estimate. There are some college cost estimators out there, um, but I would just recommend just apply for the FAFSA and then you'll find out what 
um, you'll qualify for. So the other thing with the FAFSA that I think has been mentioned, but even if you know you won't qualify for a Pell Grant or some of the other financial aid from FAFSA, the institution that you're going to, in order to receive any of their funding, they're going to require you to do the FAFSA as well. So that's just kind of the best place to start. If you're able to complete the FAFSA, that's gonna be the best way to start and find out. Um, so say you're, you're applying to University of Michigan uh, and, and you know you, don't, you won't qualify for federal aid, you still do need to complete the FAFSA because then that will kickstart um, the financial aid department at University of Michigan to start taking a look at your information. Your application to the college won't do anything with financial aid. It's that FAFSA coming into their mailbox that is that that alerts them to start looking, oh, here's somebody, got to take a look at this person, and then they'll determine what they can give you. So it's not a perfect guideline, but most families who qualify for um, free or reduced student lunch will receive some sort of grant funding through PAL. And then families who, who earn, you know, basically, it's almost like double, up to double of um, the the reduced lunch rate. So let's say family of five hundred and twenty thousand. Your student will probably not get much for grant aid, but they should still be eligible for student loans. So if that it's if that's helpful at all, I don't know, but um, it kind of gives you a feel for what it's like. There are no per it's a formula, so there's no like perfect guideline. And additionally, uh, another reason to just go ahead and do the FAFSA is those. Uh, Michigan grants and loans, so the Michigan Competitive Scholarship, which is merit-based, not need-based, um, that is going to require the FAFSA as well. Um, and so that's what kind of kicks off that process to ensure that you're, you're eligible for um, those Michigan grants and scholarships as well, is the FAFSA. So again, back to that, if you are able to complete the FAFSA, you need to just go ahead and do it. Okay. 